Our next awardee presenter is Dr. Steve Horvath. Dr. Horvath is a professor in the Departments of Human Genetics and Biostatistics at UCLA. Welcome, Steve. Um, um, thank you for the invitation and the award. Um, I, <coughs> I'm motivated by the question, um, how do, can we extend human lifespan and health span? And um, to answer that question, um, I um, want to learn from other mammals. The right-hand side shows you um, three rodents, mice that live up to three years, naked mole rat can live over 30 years, and bat, certain bat species can live over 30 years. Although these animals have roughly the same size, and the question is, um, what are the molecular reasons why these animals have these different lifespans? Um, now, um, the tool I, I use are um, epigenetic clocks. So these are molecular measures of aging based on DNA methylation levels, um, modifications of the DNA molecule. And recent studies have really revealed that the DNA molecule um, is one gigantic aging clock. It really allows you to measure the ages of all cell types and tissues. Now, a central question of biology is really, why do similar species, such as mammals, have markedly different maximum lifespans? Um, there's a substantial literature on that topic, um, starting with Aristotle, 300 BC who already wrote a treatise on longevity and uh, shortness of life. And we know a lot. Um, so here I show you a very um, important study from Pedro de Magal has, who um, developed an online database called NH that profiled life history characteristics of over 3,000 animal species. And his study, but also that of many other authors, have shown that there's a very strong correlation between body weight and maximum lifespan. So here the x-axis shows body weight on a log scale. Similarly, maximum lifespan is also on a log scale. But you see market outliers. So there are um, animals who are short, um, small, and uh, weigh relatively little, but they live long. And there's a simple explanation. It's really animals that avoid predators. For example, animals that can fly live, on average, much longer lives. And here's another way to show this plot. Um, X-axis is the body weight. Um, Y-axis is a so-called longevity quotient. And it highlights um, interesting species that live much longer than expected. Um, many bat species, as I mentioned, the naked mole rat also stands out, and of course humans. Now humans cannot fly, however, again, we can avoid predators due to our larger brain size and abilities. So it is fair to say that we really understand um, the ecological parameters that explain maximum lifespan. However, we only have an incomplete molecular understanding of maximum lifespan. And um, there are several molecular theories um, with uh, um, often substantial um, um, support. Um, my particular focus are epigenetic theories. In my talk, I will focus on methylation changes. But I briefly mention other authors have looked at telomere maintenance mechanism, or more recently, um, DNA repair mechanisms may explain differences in maximum lifespan. Now, it's always easy to come up with a theory, but how do you prove such an aging theory? Um, there's really a need for very large data involving many species. Why? It's easy to develop a theory based on 10 species, and it fails when you have 20 species. And the theory in 20 species will fail once you consider 50 or 100 species. So I always felt um, we really need large data sets to address these epigenetic theories of maximum lifespan. And so as part of this Paul Allen um, project, 
we already profiled over 100 different mammalian species. Um, currently, we have generated methylation arrays data from 7,500 uh, tissue samples. And by the end of this project um, in 2020, we will have profiled over 10,000 tissue samples from over 100 mammalian species. Um, here I give you a list of species. It starts from A to Z, like zebra. Um, if you have an exciting mammalian species, contact me and I profile it for you. Um, as I mentioned, I focus on cytosine methylation. There are different types of methylation, but um, cytosine methylation plays a crucial role in the development um, of vertebrates, not of invertebrates. You don't have cytosine methylation in C. elegans or in flies, but certainly in vertebrates, it's crucial for development. Um, but of course, there's now increase, increasing evidence that methylation also plays a role in um, aging, and that's very much um, um, the rationale underlying this entire project to test this idea. More specifically, I was interested in the following hypothesis, that the rate of change in methylation correlates negatively with maximum lifespan. To be very precise, imagine you have one um, stretch of DNA that's highly conserved across mammals and you observe the increase in methylation in a one-year interval, does that increase, that rate of change, relate to the maximum lifespan of the species? Now, you can ask this question for one location, or you can um, come up with a more robust way of averaging rates of changes at over 100 locations. And so, to test that, we already have an answer regarding that hypothesis, why the project is 75% done. And here's the answer. So each dot is a different mammalian species. The y-axis shows you um, maximum um, li lifespan on the log scale. The x-axis shows you the average rate of change in 100 locations. Clearly, very strong negative correlation, around 0.7. That finding is utterly robust. Why uh, five people in my lab have worked on that, everyone with their own way of analyzing the data, everybody sees that. No matter how you analyze the data, very strong correlation between rate of change and lifespan. But let's drill much deeper. Um, here I show you um, various um, models. Each row is a linear regression model where the dependent variable is maximum lifespan on a log scale. Um, the first model is simply what is known already. Um, maximum lifespan very much relates to average weight of a species. And the average weight of a species explains 33% of the variance in maximum lifespan. The second model is the new one. This shows you how maximum lifespan relates to the average rate of methylation change. Suddenly, that rate of change explains 55% of the variance in maximum lifespan. Now, if you're a statistician, you will be tempted to put both covariates in the same multivariate model, average weight and also average rate of change. And if you do that, the methylation rate of change is far more significant as covariate than body weight. The methylation rate has a p-value 10 to the minus 6, whereas body weight um, um, results in a p-value um, 10 to the minus 3. Um, this, these models were based on all mammals, but you can obviously look at strata. You can, for example, look at bats. What about bats? Same story. Again, the rate of change in methylation in bat species again predicts um, the maximum lifespan of the bat species, um, R square uh, 75%. Um, now, you can analyze the data in a totally different way. Some of you know phylogenetic regression. You can do an epigenome-wide association study and just say how many CPGs relate to maximum lifespan at a Bonferroni-corrected p-value. 
And the end says thousands of CPGs, very strong signal. So the insights are twofold. First of all, yes, rate of change in methylation explains at least 50% of the variation in maximum lifespan, even after you control for other confounders like, such as body weight. Um, but overall, DNA methylation relates strongly to maximum lifespan across mammals. I'm not saying across all animals, but certainly mammals. Um, as part of that project, we needed to rely on several critical technical advances. Um, one was we needed to develop a custom methylation array that applies to highly conserved regions in the DNA of mammals. And along with it, we needed to develop software for pre-processing and analyzing these methylation array measurements. And of course, we relied on the most recent statistical modeling approaches from the uh, broader statistical community, machine learning, phylogenetic regression, and so on. I want to briefly talk about our, uh, about our custom mammalian array. Um, it profiles 37,000 CPGs that are highly conserved across mammals. And um, these CPGs are quite representative in terms of they cover CPG islands, they cover heterochromatin, they cover low methylation, high methylation. Also, we conducted careful, uh, careful titration and calibration uh, experiments to prove that this array works um, really well in data from mice and in rat. And why did we do that? Why an array? Why not sequencing? Because one of the other major aims was to develop biomarkers. For biomarkers, you need very reproducible measurements. And that leads me to another insight from our project. You can develop highly accurate estimators of chronologic age, the so-called epigenetic clocks, really in all mammals. And I will show you the data. Just to remind everyone, an epigenetic clock is really um, a readout of age, so you give me blood samples, skin samples, or sorted cells, sorted neurons, or astrocytes, or T cells. And um, I would extract the DNA, generate methylation data, and apply a mathematical algorithm, and that would give me a number. It would say your blood is 40 years old, or your neurons are 55 years old. Um, just want to show you um, some results. Um, here I show you results for a very accurate mouse epigenetic clock. So the y-axis shows the methylation age estimate of the mouse, and the x-axis is the chronologic age of the mouse. You see, of course, very high correlations. Now the dots, these are liver samples from mice, and they are um, colored by diet. And um, these kinds of analyses show that um, mice on a high-fat diet have older livers. Conversely, um, when you have calorie restriction, it's associated with slower epigenetic aging. So many people have shown these results. Um, there's quite a literature on mouse epigenetic clocks. However, um, the methylation array allowed us to really go to um, um, more exotic species. We have a very accurate clock for skin samples from beluga whales, skin samples from killer whales. More generally, we um, are in the middle of developing what we call a cetacean epigenetic clock. It, it, um, we hope it applies to all cetaceans. And that project is very much motivated by the bowhead whale that lives over 200 years. So maybe we can learn something by about um, um, extending our own lifespan and health span by studying these animals. We have a very accurate clock for dogs. If you give me the blood sample of your dog, I can tell you the age within um, roughly half a year of an error of that uh, dog. Um, what about more exotic animals? I mentioned the naked mole rat that can live over 30 years. And um, we have a very accurate clock for various tissues from the naked mole rat, correlation 0.96. 
I mentioned bat species live um, sometimes exceptionally long lives. And um, as I mentioned earlier, yes, methylation rate of change explains, explains in part why some bat species live longer than others. Um, but we also have developed a highly accurate epigenetic clocks for um, over 30 bat species. Of course, um, we study primates, vervet monkey, baboon. Here I show you results for many tissues from the vervet monkey correlation, again, 0.97. But more generally, it's actually very easy to develop an epigenetic clock that applies to all primates. Why is it easy? High sequence similarity. So here I um, have um, six different species. But let's come to a question. Do human epigenetic clocks predict age in other species? Imagine you build a human epigenetic clock in blood samples from the Framingham Heart Study. Does it predict age in other species? The answer is for some clocks that is true. So here's one clock that we developed just using the human data and applied it to baboon liver samples, high correlation. But on a more outlandish level, we analyze blood samples from dogs, and this human clock still applies to these blood samples from dogs to some extent in the sense of high correlations. Remember, we have a, bat, a, a, a clock for bats, which is based on wing punches in bats. Now, we applied it to ear punches of sheep, and you see a correlation almost 0.8. So it's mind-boggling that these bad specific clocks validate. And I want to emphasize there's no refitting. We use the same coefficient values, the same mathematical algorithm, the same everything from the bad clock and simply apply it to the um, uh, sheep data. We have a zebra clock and it works beautifully in tissues from horses. Which brings me to the topic, universal clock. Wouldn't it be nice to have a universal clock where you give me a tissue sample from an animal, but you don't tell me what species it is. You just say, here's a sample. You, you don't even tell me what tissue it is. You just give me DNA. Can I measure the age of that sample? And um, we have feasibility data. This is very much work in progress, but... Um, these are results from randomly testing, um, uh, from randomly splitting the data. And yes, very high correlations. Um, when you include humans, you get super high correlations. But even if you remove humans, the correlation is still 0.89. So yes, um, that seems to be possible. And now this clock is based on several hundred CPGs, but um, you could ask, well, what about if I have only a handful of CPGs, in this case, six CPGs? You still can build reasonably um, good age estimators. I'm not, I wouldn't call it a clock. The correlation isn't good enough. But you see, it kind of works in many species, only six CPGs. You can um, develop epigenetic clocks for relative age. What, what do I mean by that? You take the chronologic age of an animal to, and divide it by its maximum lifespan. That is a relative measure of age, a number between zero and one. And you can build predictors of that relative age. So in conclusion, um, what I've shown to you today is, yes, rate of change in methylation strongly relates to maximum lifespan in mammals. Um, yes, we can ep define epigenetic clocks in all mammalian species, even bats, naked mole rat, anything. Some, not all, but some epigenetic clocks are actually conserved across species. Um, I showed you uh, data that illustrate that, yes, one can develop universal aging clocks. It's feasible. But there's no doubt that species-specific clocks are actually more accurate. Um, I want to um, thank a very large group of collaborators that have shared generously tissues from many animals. There's a long list of people who um, uh, looked into their freezers and sent me tissues and DNA. And with that, I stop. Thank you so much. Do they have time for a question?
or two, if there are any. So I was wondering, have you ever tried applying this clock to either uh, cancer or to like immortalized cell lines? Um, I'm wondering both for sort of a basic biology standpoint and also could this be used diagnostically, right? Can I look at a sample and see what is the age relative to the age of the host animal uh, and then see is it you know, out of homeostasis or whatever? Yeah, I mean, we certainly applied the clock to cancer, but also many other people apply it to cancer. There's quite some literature. When you look at malignant tissue, the clock is really disrupted in both ways. Some cancers have greatly accelerated aging. For example, luminal breast cancers. Other cancers, the opposite. They, the tissue seems much younger. For example, basal breast cancer. You know. um, more generally, the question is, does the clock actually predict onset of cancer? You know? And um, this in, in an, the answer is yes in an epidemiological sense. So these epigenetic clocks applied to blood predict cancer, but this, the associations are not strong enough to be clinically useful, you know, so maybe that, yeah, thanks. One more question. Um, is there any reason to believe that manipulating the clock will do something to uh, the state of the animal? <laughs> Everybody asks that question. Um, they, um, there's now indirect evidence that um, these methylation changes, when you reverse them, you know, that they um, are associated with um, beneficial readouts, you know, when you use other molecular biomarkers, uh, cellular measures of um, damage and so on. So there's, uh, there's several articles that are forthcoming. Yeah. But that's a million-dollar question. Thank you so much. Yeah.